All right, guys, I'm here to tell you the uh, story about Voter Tide, uh, the rise of it, the fall of it, um, and just kind of uh, things I learned during my time there. Um, so let's see here, Voter Tide, what we did, I'll just start with the basic stuff. Uh, we were basically a social media analytics company, and we tracked data um, from social media, from Facebook, from Twitter, from blogs out there in real time to find out how people were reacting online to uh, political figures, political issues. And we'd analyze that data and basically be able to give a client a quick view like this and basically say, okay, right now about Mitt Romney, here are the top trending articles about him, here are the phrase people are using him uh, on Twitter, uh, and then just some basic stats over there about number of Twitter followers, number of uh, Facebook friends, stuff like that. Uh, this is always kind of a little private joke of mine. You could set goals in the system, but I never set one for Mitt Romney. <laughs> um, and this is basically a uh, monthly subscription-based service. Uh, we also had a couple cool partnerships. We had a big one with the Washington Post where during the convention speeches for the Democratic and uh, Republican conventions, we analyzed data from Twitter in real time and were able to um, basically show the sentiment of um, the social space as the speech was unfolding. So um, we actually reached points where we were analyzing uh, just about 1,000 tweets per second in real time as it streamed, pulling out links that were being shared, pulling out hashtags that were being used, uh, keywords that were being used, issues that were talked about. So during a speech, we could say that, um, we'll say that uh, Ryan was talking about healthcare. We could find out if that was actually um, resonating with people, if it was positive, if it was, if, if it was negative. And really, um, some, some, some very cool technology that uh, both Matt Barr built and uh, Paul Graff back there. Um, so here's the good stuff. Basically, during the life of the company, we had about two to three dozen uh, voter type pro subscribers. And these were companies that were either individual campaigns, they were um, people like the Nebraska Democrats that had, had a lot of smaller campaigns to work with, uh, a lot of consulting firms that worked on maybe six, seven, eight, nine campaigns at a time. Uh, the monthly fee to use the software was between three to five hundred bucks a month, uh, a couple of bigger than that. Uh, we also had a product called Voter Tide Alerts, which I'll go into uh, here in a minute, but basically for that we had about a thousand users. And what would happen was, if we sent some trending information online about Mitt Romney, uh, we know at any given time that normally Mitt Romney gets 20 tweets a second, 30 tweets a second, but because we keep that data in memory and real time, we could find out if suddenly it spikes to 200 tweets a second, we would send out a text message to people who subscribe to that uh, feed and say, hey, Mitt Romney's trending right now with a link to our analysis that they would then open on their mobile device and kind of find out, okay, it's trending for this reason or for that reason. It's something I need to worry about or something that we can just forget about and keep on with our day. Uh, during the lifetime of the company, we received about $600,000 in equity investment. Uh, that was from Invest Nebraska, Gordon Witten, um, Optimist Group, uh, Doug Wilwarding, a uh, great guy here in town. Uh, we were acquired by MindMixer here in February of 2013. And uh, we had a lot of good partnerships. I mean, we provided data to the um, Washington Post, USA Today, Business Week, uh, some uh, Bloomberg data. And, you know, we, we really got out there, got a lot of good coverage, but we just weren't able to um, hit the point of profitability fast enough to, to really keep it going into 2014. So here's a quick timeline. Milestones, basically late summer 2011, uh, Voter Tide originally was a product called Rockdex, where we did the exact same thing that we do for politicians, but for bands. So we could say that right now, Green Day's trending online. Uh, it was used by several different rec record labels if they wanted to sign one of 10 different bands to find out the one people actually cared about, to find out if it actually had legs in social media or not. Uh, but in the summer 2011, uh, I was talking to my dad, and my dad said, hey, use this for politicians, because I want to know what people are saying about Subtle. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like a good idea. I discussed it with uh, Invest Nebraska, uh, also with a kind of a mentor of mine, uh, Gordon Witten. He's a guy here in town, founded Sojourn and several other companies. And he liked the idea and decided to invest and come on full-time as a partner. Um, at that time, we hired two salespeople. We had five employees and almost a $10,000 a month burn, which is uh, one of the major failing points I will talk about. February 2012, uh, Optimus Group and Doug Wilbert invested. We hired a CTO, we hired a biz dev person, we hired PR. Uh, we had a pretty clear, clear vision for growth. We had eight employees, and that burn rate just kept on going up. Uh, summer of 2012, that's when we released voter tight alerts. Uh, pretty good fanfare, a lot of it, uh, good adoption. People really dug the application. Uh, we did email matching, which I'll get into, and that's kind of uh, one of the lessons I will present to you today. 
Uh, we had 12 employees in between a $35,000 and $45,000 a month burn. Uh, we made a lot of trips to DC. We spent a lot of money in advertising, and things got expensive fast. Uh, let's see, here we go back a page. In September, October 2012, uh, we had the Washington Post partnership. Uh, Optimist Group made a follow-on investment, and also we came to terms that they would do a follow-on investment of X number of dollars, and if we were making 12500 bucks in uh, a month in recurring revenue, they would do another larger follow-on investment. So basically, it was that point where if February came and we were making that much money, that means that there was clear, clear growth, uh, a lot of traction, and then you just kind of pour gasoline on the fire. Uh, we also began working on something called Social Gridiron, and honestly, that was kind of a last-ditch effort to make some money. And we did. People liked it a whole lot. We partnered with the World Herald, um, a bunch of good newspapers, and the technology is being mimicked right now by a lot of companies out there, and it seems like it's a cool idea. Uh, December 2013, we are low on cash, and we have too many employees, we have a big burn, uh, and it was late in that month when I had to tell all of our employees that, hey guys, we're out of money, we can't make payroll. Uh, if we hit this goal in, 2000, or in, in February, we can actually get another significant round of investment and re really take this thing where it's going. Um, so it was one day when I had to basically call them all in my office one by one and say, we can't make payroll. It's a very sad day. I'm kind of choking up right now. What made that day worse was I was driving home that day, super bummed out, like 7.30, I saw a dog get hit by a car and run over. They sucked. So then February 2013, um, we were acquired by, by, by my mixer for the voter type technology. And um, it was a hard decision to make because basically I had spent the past four or five years of my life doing this nonstop. Um, it's my baby, it's something I poured my heart, soul, all my effort, everything into. And I just want to keep fighting, just shoestring budget, you know, making 500 bucks a month to, for myself to take home and pay what meager bills I had. And just fight and fight and fight and fight and fight tooth and nail. But um, I was talking to Gordon one day and he gave me the advice. He said, Jimmy, life's too short to spend nurturing something that might not be a good idea anymore. Uh, don't fight for something that might not be worth it down the line. Don't just sit there in zombie mode for the next two or three or four years because you don't know where it's going to go. Just let it go because there's a lot of time in the future to start something new which could be a lot bigger. So that, remember that when you're facing a situation like this that I hope you never do. So I could have done better. I've thought a lot about what I've done wrong, what I could have done better, um, and here are a couple of key points for me to talk about. That's 2020. Uh, I don't think we had a good enough product market fit. Um, as soon as we got that investment from uh, Gordon, basically I spent a lot of my time trying to manage people, trying to get some biz dev going, and not talking with customers enough. Uh, hiring salespeople and not actually getting out there in the field and understanding what people wanted, what was good, what was bad. Um, we did it some, but not to the level that I think we could have done. Uh, it is from insight we got from customers where, where we built a, a few key features, reporting, uh, voter tide alerts, and those by far were the best used features. But the features I thought were great, nobody cared about. So it's, it's, it's really um, important to go out there and find out what people like, what people don't like, and don't waste your time on something that just you have a gut feeling about always. Um, I hired for roles that I should have, uh, that I shouldn't have filled too quickly. I spell in there. Um, we hired a biz dev guy. We hired two sales guys. And again, it should have been me out there working on biz dev, st biz dev stuff. It should have been me working on, on sales. It should have been me, me working on some code stuff. Um, just because you get the investment doesn't mean that the next day you kind of stop doing what you're doing. Um, it doesn't change like that overnight. You basically have to instill the values you have, the ideas you have, the thoughts you have into all of your employees, and it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. Which means I didn't give our employees a clear path to success, and I never gave them clear expectations. Uh, being a startup founder, I worked on it day or night. I lived it, I breathed it, I loved it. Um, it's all I thought about all the time. And you can't expect employees that you hire to do, to do the exact same thing. You can with some people, um, and they're rare, and they're hard to find. But some people just need, need some guidance in, 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 in some direction. Um, and it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just that um, people need to know what they can do to be good. Uh, people need to have expectations of what you want them to do. Um, as far as a clear path to success, uh, Nathan taught me one key lesson at MindMixer, which I always remember now. Uh, I had three people working for me in, in, in a team there, plus myself. And he would say every week that, Jimmy, you have 160 hours of time to make sure 
you're, you're filling with work for people to do. And at, at Voter Tide, I wasn't doing that. Uh, we had people, we had the bandwidth, we had the manpower, but I wasn't taking enough time out of my day to actually plan, okay, here's what everybody needs to be working on this week. Here's what people need to be working on the week after. And really projecting that out because, you know, sometimes if employees don't have a clear vision of where the company's going or what's going on in, in the immediate future, they flounder. And it's of no fault of their own, but it's just something to um, be very aware of. Uh, finally, we got caught up in a lot of distractions. And with distractions, you don't realize this until it's too late, because at the time it seems like a great idea, it seems like a pivot, it seems like it's something wonderful to do. Um, if Phototide Alerts hadn't turned out as well as it did, in hindsight, I'd be saying that was a distraction. Um, however, we did things like email matching. Uh, this, we thought, was a very lucrative business. Uh, what we did was we looked at everybody who tweeted about Mitt Romney in a positive way and negative about Obama, um, uh, negative about Obama on Twitter during a two-month time frame. And we found out the names of people because they're on Twitter. We found out the city, the location, the rough ages of people because all that data is out there. You guys are volunteering tons of information, and I do it too. Anyways, there's companies out there that have email lists. And these email lists have Jimmy Winter, Omaha, Nebraska, 61st Avenue, 32 years old. And if we take our data where we say that this guy, J Jimmy tweeted pro-Obama, or Jimmy tweeted uh, negative Obama, and then match that against a voter file, we found a lot of people, this, this is a wild, crazy experiment that we sent out letters to in, in tandem with the Romney campaign. I felt dirty about it, but it happened. And, uh, it was an ask for money, and the normal response is about 1%, and apparently they had a 5% response to this. So it was gangbusters. It was the greatest thing ever. So we dropped everything and began working on that, kind of neglecting voter title alerts and neglecting voter title as a product. And uh, in that business, orders come in slow. There's a very slow sales cycle, a very slow turnaround time, and it just didn't turn around fast enough for us. So basically, we spent eight weeks spinning our wheel, building another cool technology, that never got put to work. So it's just an important thing that if you think you have a pivot, you better make sure it's a good one right away and better make sure that that you know, sales cycle's quick enough so you don't get screwed in the long run. But uh, just don't, don't get distracted. We spent a lot of time in this viral video. We thought it was gonna make voter title alerts go huge. Um, it didn't. It was just a viral video <laughs> that like 100 people watched. <laughs> uh, and finally, Social Gridiron. Um, very cool product. Actually, Paul spent many, many nights super late actually getting this thing done, and I'd like to applaud Paul for that again. And it was super cool. We had a lot of users, a lot of traction. People loved it, but people didn't want to pay for it, it turns out. So that was kind of a bummer. <laughs> uh, those are all of my lessons for you. Uh, ask me anything. <laughs>